Yo, yo, yiggity, yo, what's good? And welcome to Philosophy Digestion. My name is John Gavin, and we're back today talking about the island of Great Britain, gods, kings, and queens, the faith that kept them in power, as well as the system in Europe that caused most people to slave their lives away working for those gods, kings, and queens. People who forsake these peasants, these serfs, to a maskless pandemic, starvation, and some of the worst years that history can remember. Just so these kings and queens could own more property for themselves and, I guess, God. And this is the philosophy behind the hit television series Game of Thrones and the novels A Song of Ice and Fire. Welcome to part one, and this story does contain major spoilers for the Game of Thrones series and reality, all tied together with some philosophy. Listener discretion advised. Human history has no breaks in violence and conflict. It's just kind of like one great war because humans always want more than they have. This does include the people of Great Britain, which is a half the size of California, yet this Atlantic island were the overseers of the Great British Commonwealth. And that seems crazy, but it all stems from the ideology that was used by the kings and queens and the characters in Game of Thrones. So like the 1000 years between the year 1000 and 2000 were like super violent. Great Britain was at the center of a lot of what history talks about. There was violence and wars other places as history is, like I said, one great war. But Great Britain had a huge part in writing that history. And this episode will flow into talks about Shakespeare, other philosophies to come. We came out of the 1000s to 2000s, that millennium, with stories of battles advancing and political techniques. Those born on that Atlantic island of Britain were the first to conquer, claim, and so their descendants to inherit land and wealth who thousands of peasants died to claim. These are the ideas that are core, original to things like the United Nations and NATO and democracy. And it's important to understand the kind of world that those ideas were born in. It's a lot easier to understand the struggles for power when we look at stories like Game of Thrones as opposed to the ones that affect our lives and the kinds of resources we're going to have. The connection between storytelling and Shakespeare and Game of Thrones and the Bible and the King, it all represents a lot about how we view human nature and human leadership. Those views that we share affect the way that we choose to behave and the kinds of behavior that we think is acceptable. The war, it's written... <laughs> I don't know. I think that we're all blind to what we don't know. And often, the people teaching don't pay homage to that. So let's cut to Winchester in the 1300s. Lights up to King Edward III, we'll call him Ed, we're in his private chambers. He's basically Robert Baratheon from Game of Thrones, the king on the Iron Throne since the fall of the Roman Empire, or the Targaryen dynasty, who conquered the island of Westeros, united the people, and then their leadership perished. So King Ed is in his private chambers discussing with his royal advisor slash wife, Philippa, She's from a place that starts with an A. So there's a lot of growing hate in their country for the French. The people of Britain think the French are bad people and they don't deserve to be as successful as them. They're very prejudiced towards French people. At this time, England is united. It's the southeastern corner of the Atlantic island 
Britain. And to the north, we have the kingdom of the north, Scotland. England is united. It's the closest to France and Europe, separated by a small channel of water. The king or queen of this European island and the landlords, including their extended family, make up about 1 to 2 percent, 1 to 2.5 percent of the population of this European island. And these are 90 percent of the characters we know and love from Game of Thrones. The Lords and Ladies, the Educated, the Houses, the Lannisters, the Tyrells, the Tullys. Uh, in Shakespeare, it's the Montagues, it's the Capulets, it's the families from Midsummer Night's Dream, I think. You also, you had to be the oldest son to inherit anything or make any decisions. Even most of that small number, of that one to 2.5%, don't even get to vote, LOL. The royalty, though, were the only property owner. They owned all of the land and just got to say who was in charge of managing it. Kind of like property owners do with property managers. That also includes the things on the property. So like the buildings and the supplies and the people. All of the stuff that the people used to live their lives, their food, their beds, it all belonged to the person who owned who owned the land. And all of these things that people used to live their lives and make their art and blacksmith or, you know, their tools, the stuff they make from the land, that, all that stuff is called the means of production. It's the stuff you need to live your life and create and work and contribute to your community the means of production and if you know why and so even if you wanted to you couldn't leave with your stuff because you're stealing uh you yourself are property you can't steal god's property it belongs to the king so king ed and philippa are the owners of all the land they're hanging out and in their bedroom she's combing her hair and they're kind of plotting on as humans do how they can acquire more property and grow their business and they want to make sure they're making good investments, have a solid retirement plan, leave their kids behind a good legacy, you know, all that stuff that humans just want. So King Ed and Philippa, the owners of the land in, in England, Philippa's brushing her hair and she looks at King Ed and she's like, you know, I think the boys are ready for more responsibility. And the king nods and is like, um, I think that we can definitely make. So like the good crop fields and the precious gem rigs, and everything all over the land they get decide to decide what happens with the gems and the crops and the money and all of the stuff they harvest from God's natural resources that they own and the people aren't always happy because they want to use the means of production how they want they also want God's king to be just out in the community if you know what I'm saying the king and queen have five sons there's Ed B. Prince, and him and his dad are basically the same person. They die at the same time, and they're just, you can almost think of them as one person. And they are both Robert Baratheon. So, King Ed slash Robert Baratheon and his wife and his son and all their sons are stoked because the people of England are feeling united under this one great king. They're stoked about it. And so they're strong and not killing each other and sharing. The men in the north and the women are just too hardy and strong. And the Welsh have ancient knowledge that not even the English were able to imperialize. And the king and his wife advisor are like, all right, we can unite against France. This seems like a good common thing to bond us all. And they suck and they're terrorists and they're hoarding all of the good bread and wine and cheese of course, as the French do. The king and the queen wanted to own the property in France and be God's king there. And they wanted to do that so that they could subjugate the people of France and buy their bread and wine and cheese and their goods and their services for dirt cheap because they won't have any English currency and bring it all back to their tiny island to sell and share uh, f and make a profit on because all the people there just have tons of it. the 1300s, I don't know, like little coins, whatever they were. And they will get strong from the food. And they're, 
the the whole people, everyone in England doesn't like the French. Like I said, they're super prejudiced, so they're not going to pay them a fair wage or treat them like true equals, which is the payment that the working people of France and Scotland, and the Queen, you know, turns to the King and she's like, Ed, this is brilliant. We can buy the French bread for dirt cheap and then bring it here, hot iron it with uh, English, like, little iron stamp, and then sell it at a more expensive rate to all the English people, make more money, they have more money, and then we'll have tons of money, and tell them to hate French people. We can keep them over there. They won't be able to move here, won't be able to get educated. It, it'll it, Just trust me, Ed. It'll work out. And then Ed's like, the end, I have an idea. The English are going to go over to France and make sure they're sharing fairly with England, if you know what I mean. And the invading business owners from our great nation are going to share our strong currency and economy with them without subjugating the people of England to limited employment opportunities or and the poor French bread maker Cloud works day in and day out in his French kitchen which is newly under British control and they have the right to buy or take all of the bread till all of Cloud's neighbors are starving and they don't have any they don't have enough bread to feed their own community and then the people there turn to crime and try and migrate and then those are Viking raiders that the English are scared of and it's causing all kinds of conflict but if there's a united England then they are strong and they can take whatever conflict comes their way as we have seen. Philippa and the English learned from the Roman Empire, the Targaryens, which was like the United Nations before the year 1000. And centuries of, you know, rule by the Roman Empire, the native religions in England were assimilated or destroyed or hidden amongst the Welsh, the strongest people on that island. You know, the old gods, the children of the forest, the Imperial invaders have no respect for the wrath of Mother Nature or the White Walkers. And after the Roman Targaryen Empire fell, their grip on the Atlantic island of Great Britain was no more. They never actually truly got... They never destroyed the old ways, just the people's ability to practice it through music and storytelling. The reason the people of England were united behind King Ed, and the reason the people of Westeros were united behind Robert Baratheon and the Targaryens, were because they were a group or groups of people who shared one idea of what a king should be. And those ideas were represented in their stories and in their ways that they understood their history. Built a bond together, you know, intermarried, shared their lives, and began to share views of the world around them, the leaders who they respected and the communities that they wanted to be a part of, and the kinds of communities that they felt were damaged or flawed or dirty, you know, against goodness and the church. And most people in on the island at the time identified with at least the structure of the Roman leadership governing body like that. And the entire island maintained laws and language that were close to the Targaryen Roman rule. They used the same castle infrastructure, uh, cities, roads. It's not like when the Roman Empire fell, the people and their way of being also fell. And a lot of Celtic and pagan practices held strong by the Welsh, which were the old ways, held high by the Scottish king, the kings of the north, you know, those who had the Roman Catholic, English, united king, whatever you want to call it, trying to dominate and control their distinct language and cultures, ways of sharing resources and believing in justice. The Anglo-Saxons, 
merged with native Britons and their descendants fought each other and weren't able to go out and conquer other places until we get to the point that they're all willing and ready to support this one king. And that's a fragile thing to hold on to, as Game of Thrones shows us. King Ed and Philippa, they want to be more strategic about their invasion of France and their <laughs> uh, conquering the Kingdom of the North Scotland, while also maintaining control and unity within the kingdom. And they think that the way to do that is by having a strong bloodline and having multiple people in that bloodline hold power. They're not happy with the current peace deal going on with Scotland. There's a constant war and battle happening there and whispers that maybe their king is the true king. If you want to understand why everyone hates the English and why the Scottish didn't want the English to rule, please watch the movie Braveheart by, with Mel Gibson in it. The British sucked. The British sucked. They were abusive and mean to the people of the lands that they conquered. And it was sad. It's not like the king announced, and trigger warning, you know, rape, violence, theft, murder, all of just the word in the hand of God's king. And it was obvious when there wasn't justice happening, but it took a lot to convince the people to mobilize and sacrifice their lives and their ways of living so that a just king could sit on the throne. King Ed knows that any new battles or wars that he starts and whatever he sets up is going to affect his son, the next king, Ed B. Prince, who has his own family and house and son, Richard II. So everyone beneath the royal family like the lords and the ladies, were not as worshipped by the people. And no one believed necessarily that they should be king or queen or anything like that. They had goals that didn't always align with the royal family, like the Tullys and the Freys. So Philippa the queen is, you know, brushing her long, beautiful queen hair. And she's like, Ed, why don't we divide England into five duchies? five equal sections and put each of our sons in control. You know, put someone from our family, our strong bloodline, like right there so that the people can see them. They can hang out with the high class royalty of the area, you know, really make a difference in the community. Hopefully bring our kingdom some strong ties. And so that's exactly what happens. Each of their sons gets control of one duchy. It was also kind of because the king and queen didn't trust whoever was already in charge of that area, like the Tullys. And you can imagine if, you know, King Robert put one of his sons just kind of in charge of the land that the Tullys or the Freys or the Starks, or they'd be pissed. Even though I think Philippa had one idea, it um, didn't, as we'll see, work out in her favor. But the king's like, that's an amazing idea. And he divides his property up, gives it to his five sons, and they begin ruling and maintaining control while the king focuses on the war with France. At this point, Philippa and Ed only really trust their family, and there's turmoil that's boiling in the kingdom because there's a maskless pandemic, no food, no Purell, etc. And the king treats his people like literal slaves, and they don't like it implicitly because that's not how humans are supposed to live. They're called serfs. They're tied to their job, and if they leave, they'll starve. Or their families won't be able to maintain the... If they're, you know, a little higher born or have marketable skills, and they just don't want to be a blacksmith one day, their family will lose everything. It must have been really hard living in the 1300s. But since the leadership and the people who can read are mostly chilling, they're not inspiring conflict in the people and they can mostly dominate those that they keep uneducated and um, locked into their land. So the most important brothers for you to remember are Ed B. Prince, who I mentioned, the future king, Prince John of Lancaster, and Prince Edmund of York. So these three brothers and then the other two are all ruling their prospective duchies over families that aren't super stoked on them being there. 
And the Catholic Bible speaks of a king over the land destined by God to rule. And the only catch was God chose whoever was able to get there. So you're born into a world and there's a king and that's who God chose. And what they don't tell you is exactly how violently the king got there. And the people born into the king's land were simply told that God has spoken, which is exactly how the electoral college system works in the United States when you include the primary election. The thing is, King Ed actually created a whole new class of nobility when he put his children in charge of their regions above the lords and ladies, but who only represent a part of the king's hand. And honestly, they can conflict with each other. Siblings bicker, let me tell you. And I bet you they kind of became homies to an extent of the people on their land or in their houses. You know, they want more of the good bread over there in Lancasterville other than York. But it's all chill for a minute because they're united against France. Everyone knows who's in charge, King Ed. They do have conflicting goals. Different communities and stories, beliefs about how just the king is. And censorship was huge at this time improv, music, device storytelling about like, you know, love and trauma that does not match up with what the king wants the people to believe and what's going to keep them thinking that he's a just king. Their stories and knowledge and ideas were limited to their houses and the communities that they lived in because, and they also weren't sending letters or texting or emailing. They didn't have messenger hawks like they do in Game of Thrones. Whatever the people around you were saying was what you heard and what you believed. The people that the English squandered had stories. The English had the stories that they wanted perpetuated. You know, Jesus and their one true king. To remember violent, terrible attacks on their country at the hands of their political enemies, like the French or the illegal Viking migrants. One king uniting against these things and telling people what to say and what to think with his stories is doable. But if there's a fracture and there's suddenly different stories being told amongst one united group of people, stuff's gonna stop moving. So the French are sick of having the English just abuse them, steal their bread, take their wine, you know, the whole shtick. So Philippa, is working with the highborns on spreading stories about how, you know, England's best are being killed by Welsh and French attack. Because information flowed so slowly, transition and shifting in ideas, if it was done quickly, it was done violently. The king and the queen told their, you know, friends and highborn folks to spread the word because they could also spread fear that way. The French are terrorists and they need to be stopped. And instead of going, wow, it's a little extreme. Um, maybe they've experienced a lot of pains at our hands and um, we should share a little bit and maybe try and find peace. People were ready to believe their leader and just kind of blindly hate, as well as propaganda against the Scottish, the Welsh, and other undesirables. And subconsciously, they understand if their country wins a war, that they will benefit and they will have, you know, the cheap access to good French bread and wine. If they don't keep that domination over France, then they're going to lose that. And it's super easy to think that you're entitled to the things that you have around you, especially if you're those people's kids and you're just used to the good French bread and you're eating it and you're like, wow, this is awesome. It's easy to believe that it's just, but it doesn't mean that it's not stolen French bread and that that French cloud isn't suffering at the hands of the British Empire in the 1300s, of course. And humans will tell you any story <laughs> to get you to let them keep living the lives that they want. For this land is their land and they're free to do and think as they please. The only way to earn property was to convince others <laughs> that it was yours by God's will or the king's favor because he's God's king. 
as the most convincing stories about justice and faith and ownership come from spirituality and our beliefs about what's right and wrong, the kind of ownership that humans are allowed to exert. And whoever thrusts their ass into that throne, we trust with the world because that's the king God chose. But see for yourself. And going against God's king is a crime because it's heresy and it has terrible consequences with local law enforcement. It took persuading the people that their king had God's divine right to rule. So King Ed and Philippa are talking with the local clergy you know, really trying to get this propaganda machine moving. And they're trying to get them to spread the word that Prince uh, Philip IV um, in France isn't actually supposed to be the king of his land and that that is super uh, against God, you know, his idea of one true king and getting all of the Christians in England really jacked up about the fact that this dude Philip's on the throne in France when he should not be. King Ed and Philippa begin the 100-year war which is really just a 100 year segment in that little, across that little teeny channel of the great human war. So it's almost 1400, um, no light inside the darkness except fire at night because they don't have electricity. And the children of Ed are maintaining control of their duchies. The siblings bicker, but it's all right. They're trying to enslave more Scottish people, flogging any non-Christians, stealing literally all of the potatoes from my people in Ireland and being horrifically abusive to the peasants of their own. Starting wars with other countries so that everyone where that they live with can have cheaper stuff. English peasants are stoked. God wants this. We have more bread. He's giving us more bread. It just seems so like, you know, the economy's working and we're seeing growth. I'm so happy that no one's suffering and everyone is just following the hand the invisible hand of God. But sad. Ooh. There's one thing that no matter what the economy is like, hits us all. In 1376, the oldest son and future king, Ed B. Prince, dies suddenly in a war. Everyone isn't sure what's going on because it's they're all separate in different duchies and they couldn't text or email or nothing. Low key, now all of the brothers are like in competition for the throne. Everyone high key in their land wants their duchy master to be king because then they know they're gonna get the freshest bread that's been stolen from France. So everyone feels the exact same way about their leader. So they could be easily persuaded that maybe, maybe, maybe my guy's, maybe my guy's God, God's true king. Before long, definitely before any problems are solved, the King Ed himself dies. So Robert Baratheon, I said that King Ed and Ed B. Prince are basically Robert. Um, Robert Baratheon is dead. He died in battle. Or so we're told. There's this question of who's going to be king. Should it be the next oldest brother? Or should it be Ed B. Prince's son? So now we've got like... Alright. Is it the king's brothers like Renly Baratheon or Stannis Baratheon? Or is it going to be Joffrey who's king now that Robert is dead? And just like in Game of Thrones, the uh, local manipulators choose Joffrey to be king and the Baratheon brothers take their people and start a war. The closest to the throne were Ed's council and clergy. Uh, so his wife, the priests, you know, God's propaganda machine. And they choose the 10 year old son of Ed B. Prince to become king because they know that he'll be easy to manipulate and they pass over that entire generation of uncles really pissing them. And they also take away the opportunity for those uncle's children to become king. So basically there's a Tommen in charge this is 10-year-old Richard II. This 10-year-old boy was originally a puppet and completely subject to the clergy of the Catholic Church, who was a king at an innocent child age of 10. And we know what great and virtuous childcare the church provides. And then totally related, 
the people all said that Richard II had horrible emotional issues, probably resulting from some type of childhood trauma, and everyone was mad that he wasn't able to have kids. And so an emotionally unstable puppet king, maybe he started as a Tommen, but he sounds like he turned into a Joffrey. Everyone starts to think, ooh, it would be... So he's being a Joffrey, crazy, emotionally unstable, no one likes him, and there's not even a uh, clear air. So everyone's starting to think that maybe it would have been better if one of the uncles uh, had taken the throne, you know, Stannis or Renly. The brothers that I mentioned earlier, Lancaster and York. The uncles, Lancaster and York, are talking mad shit and rallying their people up in their duchies and trying to convince them to go to war so that this king, so that their king is no longer a child. And it does take a lot of convincing because they honored Ed and respected the passing of the throne to this 10 year old and they don't want to sacrifice themselves for war. God would not put a child on the throne, they begin to say. If the right heir was seated, then all the homies in the duchy are going to have greater access to that French bread, English crops, and maybe a greater chance to advance in life. Plotting against the 10 year old king might have been easy for these guys, but like I said, they couldn't text or email or TikTok about it. The anger behind the people needed time to boil. War is stupid bloody and crazy, just like in the second book of the Song of Ice and Fire series, Clash of Kings. As the young, emotionally unstable king grows, his claim to the throne faces protests and pandemics, starvation, and all the things that just were happening from the year 1000 to the year 2000. It comes from bad leadership. His uncles are plotting against him and he's just a little sad abuse boy and I feel really bad for him honestly. I bet I don't even think that he wanted to be king. But it, I guess it was his only way to survive because he'd always be a threat to the throne. Find out what happens. <laughs> Does Richard II keep the throne? Will he be killed? What's going on? Find out on the next episode of Philosophy Digestion. And thank you for listening. If you would like to put the effort into something that would make a huge difference for our small team, please rate, review, and subscribe. Share us on social media. You don't have to agree with me, but just use the concepts to maybe come up with something new. I have all the faith in... Today's sources include Captive Histories, Anglo-Saxons Explained, Timeline World Histories Documentary on Ancient Britain, The World Wide Web's Military Wiki, Feature Histories YouTube Channel, BBC Radio 4, and of course, Wikipedia. Special thanks to our music provider, Pixabay. Please check them out for royalty-free music. And this podcast is produced on Acast Independent Podcast Network. For advertising and other sponsorship collaboration opportunities, hit me up, management at humorus.net. It's M-A-N-A-G-M-E-N-T at H-U-M-O-R-U-S dot N-E-T. Until next time, my name is John Gavin, and I hope that you have a good one.